we must not go to the extreme of viewing laws or theories as determining the meanings of the scientific terms they contain and hence as true by virtue of those meanings alone. It seems to me that this view has some affinity to the idea recently much emphasized by uh, Hansen and Feyerabend, uh, for example, that all scientific terms are theory laden and that their meanings change with the theories in which they function. So that when Copernicus and Hoyle, let us say, use the word the sun, they do not mean the same thing at all. And combustion nowadays means something entirely different from what it did mean at the time of the phlogiston theory. And I think I remember correctly that I heard you, Russ, and, and Paul Feyerabend cheerfully agreeing in Pittsburgh a year ago that the Wright brothers really didn't know what an airplane was. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Paul Feyerabend and I agree on so little that I remember quite clearly uh, the details whenever this happens. We certainly never agreed on what it would be absurd to agree on, namely that the Wright brothers didn't have the concept of an airplane. The Wright brothers didn't have the conception of flight, and I will try to make that clear when I uh, hold forth tomorrow. And that ties in with the second point, and it concerns uh, one of the other few things that Paul and I uh, agree on, to wit, the degree to which terms, meaning of terms, may vary from context to context and from scientific occasion to scientific occasion. And it seemed to me that uh, Peter Hempel was twisting a little bit. I think, in fact, he was nasty, brutish, and short when he <laughs> made that reference to every use of a ruler giving rise to different conceptions from every other use of a ruler. And was every uh, uh, Yes, of course, I know, but I mean, this doesn't make you less culpable for having that explained. <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't good when it first happened, but it certainly isn't good. Uh, uh, surely, uh, what is at stake is not the fact that this chap might use uh, uh, a hook-type spring scale and another chap will use an Archimedes beam balance, but rather that when the techniques are so different as to actually make us um, justify the entire undertaking in terms of quite different uh, conceptual framework. For example, uh, the, what happens when you weigh yourself in the morning in the bathroom on the uh, uh, local scale uh, surely is quite different from what was undertaken by astronomers in the 17th and 18th and 19th century when they undertook to weigh the Earth. I mean, this was a standard uh, locution and there were uh, serious uh, problems involved in both undertakings, I dare say. But uh, nonetheless, it seems to me they are different in kind and it isn't just a question of the fact that the techniques are different. Different in kind and therefore it seems to me that the conceptions uh, ought, uh, in all seriousness, to be thought somewhat affected. Uh, first of all, this uh, gives me some interesting uh, new ammunition. You know, Russ, I had never thought of this in connection with uh, uh, your views. I, uh, the, the remarks uh, I made there were uh, directed against uh, Bridgman, but I just you make me realize that one might uh, uh, raise the same doubt about your views, but now a serious matter. You see, uh, uh, the problem, uh, the problem uh, as I see it, is this. What criterion can one use for deciding when the meaning of a term changes. You certainly have their impressive examples and there are stronger examples even than the weighing example for showing that uh, well what you call the conceptual framework in terms of which one uses a one and the same word uh, is quite different in one case and in the other and uh, there is therefore uh, some quite plausible motivation for saying well really the meaning of the term has has changed but uh, is there any uh, satisfactory criterion for saying uh, up to here it's a change in empirical belief about one and the same concept we just think this man has lost some weight or that this determination of the weight of the earth was not correct uh, meaning this you without changing the concept and saying that uh, the concept has a different meaning. We have now changed the meaning of the word, but not the content of our empirical assertion. And it seems to me there isn't any clear way of making these distinctions. And it seems to me also that uh, here Nagel seems to me to be right, that at any rate uh, there is some uh, amount of vocabulary in terms of which one ultimately tests one's scientific assertions, vocabulary which uh, has a fairly 
fixed use and a fairly fixed meaning, notwithstanding the changing theoretical uh, connotations and their use in changing theoretical networks. So, uh, once more to say the specific question, how would one even tell whether there is a change of meaning or whether there is a change of assumptions about whatever it is one is talking about, weight or electricity or whatnot? There certainly are issues here to be discussed, it seems to me, but uh, 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 clearly what one does to determine the weight of a celestial object is to calculate, in terms of the theory of perturbations, what its deflection would be in some fairly well understood uh, um, field, gravitational field. I should have thought that undertaking this technique with you, uh, just in order to see whether you've gained or lost a few pounds, of course it's logically possible that one could do this, and, uh, but I, I think that it's, uh, it is so uh, far-fetched as to be... It could take a spacewalk. Uh, that, would be a, that would be different, and the instrumentation would be different, I think. <coughs> but, uh, uh, see, Braithwaite mentions in several places how, for example, the, the meaning of the term electron uh, when you consider how, for example, in uh, electrodynamics, how the term might figure uh, at the bottom of the page, near where the observation statements might be thought to have been kicked into life, uh, how this meaning will be quite different in an electrolytic context, on the one hand, as against a, a, a straight uh, alternating current context, and both of these different again from what you find, for example, in cloud chamber work. And uh, I think this argument is not al altogether impossible. I think there is a meaning difference here. And, uh, could, could I just please, please. look, uh, Russ, I'm, I'm on, I just want to really get this clear. I want to really understand what you have in mind. Wouldn't one say now, in all of these cases, this is just the wonderful thing about our having thought of electrons. It's the same kind of thing, these little things which wiggle on, and they play a role in all these three quite different phenomena. So why at first, before we had this enlightened notion, we, we thought of these as four, the three totally different kinds of phenomena. Here we see suddenly that what basically is underneath is always the same kind of thing, the great uh, uh, deepening and broadening of our insight, and it comes about because we see that these basic entities are involved in all of them, and therefore it's the same meaning. In a word, no. Mm -hmm. This is just exactly what is at issue, yeah. no. and, uh, and I certainly wouldn't agree to this. I mean, if, there's, if there are difficulties concerning what kind of an elementary entity an electron is, it would focus right on a point of this kind. I mean, after all, um, uh, many of us know the wretched history, semantical history, through which the notion of the electron has gone, and to the extent that that is so, it seems to me it isn't as if we can make a kind of hat, hat, uh, fat, dumb, and happy reference to um, the little things that wiggle, you know, wisdom's monkey on the wire sort of thing, uh, uh, that just isn't what one can do. And in a sense, it is both noting the way in which the E figures inside the electromagnetic theory or the elementary particle theory, and also noting how it's coordinated or aligned or how one steps toward the uh, roots or the experience. It, it's exactly this which is, in a sense, a determinant of the meaning here. And it seems to me that to the extent that you can say that these techniques and indeed the theories involved although they may be compatible and parallel, but there are differences, to the extent that this is so, it seems to me one ought not to settle in advance the question of whether or not they all have the same meaning or pertain to the same thing. This is the open issue about which I think there should be more uh, conversation, or less confidence, at least. If I may interpose just the question, may I ask you, don't you agree that we have situations in science which roughly correspond to my simple image here, namely that we get different lines, different fixes on the same thing? In other words, the, uh, the degree of approximation may cause some headache, but nevertheless, the scientists have a hunch that various indications, possibly probabilistic ones, point to the very same kind of entity, for instance, and therefore furnishes confirmation uh, for statements that occur in the theory. Theoretical advance usually is based on convergences of that sort. Now, whether we should speak of strict identity of meaning is another question, but that these convergences occur I think can hardly be denied in the face of the history of science. No one in his right mind would deny it. <laughs> but also, no one in his right mind would suggest that the history of science shows that all cases are the same case. That's right. And precisely what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is where there is no convergence, but in, in point of fact, many theories which show a divergence. And when you have the divergence, it seems to me you have this issue opened wide open.
once more because I'm so utterly bad at weight loss. No, you have to see one more thing about this. Namely, no, uh, you, you mentioned the case of the electrons of electrolysis, let us say then uh, electrometers you, uh, and uh, still some other context. Now, isn't it one of the great uh, prides of physics where, for example, determinations of charge and similar things can be obtained from experiments of very different kinds? And you say this precisely is one reason for saying that there really are such things, if they were just one kind of phenomenon. <coughs> Here you have this great variety of supporting evidence. This points all to there, be, there being this one underlying factor, the very fact that there are these different phenomena, and that in terms of them, what Herbert was saying, you can determine certain magnitudes by measure, measuring this kind of thing. It's something totally different. It's something still totally different. This is in fact considered as support for it. Isn't this right? And therefore, uh, here to say, ah, well, but in these contexts, electron means something different would seem to give away the show and to give away just what science would pride itself most on, having found, cut nature at the joints, and the joints there are where the electrons will go. No. no. <laughs> uh, one very brief question, though. Uh, you said, I think, that the Wright brothers did not understand what flight is, but you did not mean to say, of course, that they did not understand what the word flight means. Correct? <laughs> No, incorrect. It's more radical. It's more radical. No, I think, and this is the point that comes back to some things that uh, uh, Peter Hempel, I suppose, was in a way driving at yesterday. Well, I mean, there's a sense in which, of course, if you simply are sitting there, fat, dumb, and happy, and a bird takes off from under your nose, you can say of it that it's in flight now. Of course. <laughs> Nonetheless, there seems to me... Uh, that there are, it seems that there are other things that might be said about it. So someone says, well, what do you mean in flight now? Uh, if you mean simply that the relative gap between the ground and where the object is now is increasing, then this is going to apply in, uh, without distinction to a large number of things which you wouldn't want to call flight. Some understanding of what it is that constitutes the interaction, I should have said, between the, 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 the physical interaction between the wing of the animal and the medium through which it's moving. Some understanding of that, it seems to me, is involved in making reference to it at flight at all, because there are many things that a bird can do with wings uh, outstretched which will not constitute flight. I mean, it'll be in a stall, it'll be falling like a Steinway piano, for example. This is a possibility, and it's perfectly compatible with what one just said about this bird, you see. So to say that it's in flight is, in a sense, to commit oneself to further, I think, slightly theoretical commitments concerning the nature of the interaction between the elements in the fluid medium and the elements in the solid medium. Uh, that's right, yeah. Yes. With respect to uh, Hansen and Feyerabend, uh, it seems to me they owe us a theory of meaning uh, in terms of which uh, we can decide whether it's true that terms have uh, changed their meanings whenever a theory has been modified or replaced with another. The only reply I get from uh, Feyerabend in particular is reference to examples from physics saying that, well, look at the notion of velocity uh, in quantum mechanics or mass and so on, and look at it in, 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 uh, in classical mechanics, just see that they're different. Well, what am I supposed to be seeing here? I don't get any sort of a systematic attempt to, to uh, uh, decide, uh, uh, to provide a basis for deciding when we can say uh, that terms uh, have changed their meanings and when they, they haven't. One difficulty is uh, really has to be put at the doorstep of Russ Hansen and, uh, and others, namely they have to give us this criterion and uh, uh, who said it, uh, Peter Atchison said it also, they have to give us a criterion in terms of which we can tell when is there a change of meaning and when is it still the same concept and we make now empirically different assertions about this. And uh, here I uh, just don't know what, uh, uh, what to say and this is my, uh, my uh, basic difficulty. I uh, do have the feeling uh, that uh, the concepts which we use in order to describe the evidence have a certain stability, but this I have to say just intuitively stability in their meaning, and uh, otherwise it wouldn't be possible really even theoretically to say that we introduce now new and totally different theories which are however supported by the evidence. And, uh, 
And I felt therefore some sympathy for, for Hilary Putnam's view that the notion of temperature has the same meaning now as it had at, at Galileo's time. But I added also that uh, since precisely I'm, uh, I'm not provided with a concept of sameness of meaning and since I'm not able to offer one, I can only say I find this suggestive and interesting, but I'm not able to say uh, uh, to support this thesis clearly. I find it is helpful to look at it this way without being able to provide any clear uh, uh, theoretical elaboration of the thing. So so I have to, to uh, uh, agree with your feeling uh, uns dissatisfied with this. I'm uh, dissatisfied with it uh, myself. In response to the two Peters, they've both uh, uh, done this bit about uh, a criterion for difference in meaning. I should have thought consistency was a fairly reasonable and classical criterion. And I'll just give two examples by way of heading a list that I think would go into at least 200. Um, uh, in the Bohr theory, which was mentioned again by Peter, um, it just isn't the case, as in the classical theory, that a moving charge radiates. In the classical theory, a moving charge radiates. In the Bohr theory, the moving charge, the uh, orbital electron in the, in the hydrogen atom, just doesn't radiate. Now, here's a, a, a candidate for a difference in con concept. Both called charge different. Uh, another example is the notion of a particle in uh, 17th, 18th century mechanics, and the notion of a particle in contemporary microphysics. Uh, it is an essential feature of a quantum mechanical particle that it spreads, that it isn't uniformly locatable as a geometrical mass point. Uh, and it seems to me that that is totally different from what we have uh, in the present theory. And I should have thought that since these two are incompatible, that therefore they're different concepts. Particle, different in these two contexts. Charge, different in these two concepts. Context. Okay. I, think we'll the uh, I just want to make a general remark about the significance of this quest for general criteria for sameness of meaning, general criteria for a change in belief about the facts versus a, uh, a change in meaning, uh, uh, for the usefulness of the philosophy of science. And I have a very definite axis to grind on this. I find that because of demand, such as the one that Professor Ackenstein made, <coughs> that what we get into is this, that there's a lot of work being done in the quest for general criteria. This work ends up with negative <laughs> results. And then uh, we have a sort of uh, a general uh, skepticism or dyspepsia. Uh, we just don't really know what we've come up with, except that we know all kinds of clever proposals don't work. And then we, uh, our work you, uh, loses a great deal of the potential relevance which it may have to the actual logical concerns which scientists and other people who have philosophical interests have with specific scientific theories. Now, while I agree that I do not see in sight any program that is going to produce the sort of general criteria of sameness of meaning and so on that you are demanding, I think that's a pipe dream. <clears throat> Uh, I feel that in very specific cases, such as the ones that have been alluded to, in specific uh, uh, theories of uh, part uh, elementary particle theory, geometry, certainly, I think as Reichenbach has shown, one can, contrary to the Quinean, general Quinean conception, say, in this case, in a very interesting sense, there has been a change in the meaning of the term, uh, or in this case, in a very interesting sense, there has been a change in the belief about what the facts are. Take the, uh, after all, where does this notion come from? It comes from uh, daily life situations. If a physician were to tell uh, uh, the mother of a child that the child has acute appendicitis and the child then were uh, uh, examined and were just feeling fine, the physician would surely not say, oh, well, you see, all I mean, uh, what I really meant by this is that the child is, uh, is smiling. Uh, here uh, you have, uh, the mother would say, you've just played with words. You haven't uh, uh, done anything but wasted my time. And I think precisely this kind of thing comes up in discussions of the foundations of geometry, uh, where uh, there has really been confusion among people between the idea of saying that relatively to a certain congruence class, the geometry, uh, congruence standard, the geometry is such and such, and saying, well, if you play with the, what, what the congruence criterion is, then you can have any old uh, geometry you want. So here I would say, whatever the merits of the general uh, ne negative results of uh, uh, the work of Quine and others on this may be, I find it profoundly interesting to say to somebody, 
you have m m played with what you understand the congruence criterion to be, and therefore you've been able to come up with a statement that the geometry can be any old thing you want, and to say, on the other hand, relatively to this congruence criterion, <coughs> the geometry uh, is such and such. So I would plead for this, that we <coughs> enter specific uh, contexts and find that in these specific contexts we can articulate very usefully uh, uh, some of these distinctions and carry out piecemeal work on these specific scientific uh, uh, theories and we will then uh, helpfully clarify issues that scientists are arguing about, are interested in, without a general program uh, of criteria. And I'm sure you'll want to say something, but I'm completely against general criteria that cut across everything, unless they can be had. If they can be had, good. I, I, I've criticized uh, Hanson and Firearm for uh, coming up with uh, simply examples every time uh, I want a, a general point, and again, uh, Hanson comes up with an example. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, his, the, theory, the theory that they hold is something like this, I take it, that, that every time you, you can't learn a theory, uh, uh, that is, uh, to, to, to learn the uh, meanings of the terms in the theory, you've got to learn the theory, and every time the uh, theory changes, the meanings of the terms change. Now, it seems to me that this is a prima facie ridiculous uh, in general in general, uh, because it, it, it gives forth with uh, to various paradoxes. Uh, one is, how the devil do you learn the theory? Uh, if you've got to learn the, the theoretical concepts uh, first, and they're an integral part of the theory, how do you learn the theory? Uh, the second paradox is, how does one theory contradict another? I mean, Bo uh, Bohr uh, thought he was uh, contradicting a classical electrodynamics. Uh, and yet, if the terms in his theory mean something different from those in, in classical electrodynamics, uh, uh, he can't really have said to deny, have denied uh, classical uh, electrodynamics. And the third uh, paradox, it seems to me, uh, from this is uh, one noted by Professor Hempel, namely that uh, all propositions uh, in a theory would be analytic. Uh, that is, if you want uh, an, an, a, an atom is just the sort of thing that satisfies Bohr's postulates. So it's a Bohr atom. Uh, as it, term is, 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 is used, uh, and hence the uh, propositions of the theory would be uh, necessarily uh, true. I'm not asking for a general criterion of meaning uh, per se that will hold for all times and th things of that sort. All I'm asking is for Hansen and Feyerabend to tell me when, without, without appeal ju only to examples, tell, tell me what about these examples leads them to say that there has been a change of meaning as opposed to a change uh, in uh, our beliefs. Certainly, I am not denying that meanings change. I think sometimes they do, sometimes they do more radically than at other times. But sometimes, it seems to me, we want to describe what has gone on as simply a change in the, our beliefs and in in the postulates that we, that we make. 